There's a disturbing political trend in America that's quietly eroding the most basic constitutional rights for all Americans. As the United States engages in the second continuous decade in the war on terror, whistleblowers have alerted the public to horrific sacrifices made to their constitutional rights in the name of national security. The major structural assaults uh, carried out by the Bush administration have been embraced by the Obama administration, all of them. Whether it is the expansion of imperial war, drone attacks, the looting of the U.S. Treasury by Wall Street, most importantly, the assault on civil liberties. The federal government has proven that through a secret interpretation of broadly written federal laws, it can authorize actions that would otherwise be restricted by the Constitution. The fact is, anyone can read the plain text of the Patriot Act, and yet many members of Congress have no idea how the law is being secretly interpreted by the executive branch because that interpretation is classified. It's almost as if there were two Patriot Acts and many, many members of Congress have not read the one that matters. Our constituents, of course, are totally in the dark. Members of the public have no access to the secret legal interpretations, so they have no idea what their government believes the law actually means. Since the beginning of the War on Terror, now the longest war in American history, the American public has discovered a number of federal actions that clearly conflict with the Constitution. We cannot wait for the final proof, the smoking gun, that could come in the form of a mushroom cloud. The use of national security letters and gag orders have suppressed Americans' freedom of speech. The massive increase in federal prosecutions of journalists and whistleblowers have censored the freedom of the press. When Barack Obama ran for office, he promised to lead the most transparent administration in history. But when it comes to his whistleblower policies, the only thing that's transparent about the president is how much he values secrecy over openness. His administration has charged more whistleblowers under the Espionage Act than every other president combined. The warrantless spying and stockpiling of Americans' digital communications has effectively suspended the Fourth Amendment. The NSA is collecting the telephone records of every single human being in the United States without any regard to whether they engage in wrongdoing. They're tapping into their, their online chats, their online calls, their online interactions of every sort. The use of weaponized drones and the indefinite detention of people without a trial conflicts with the due process rights protected by the Fifth Amendment. And the use of torture techniques disguised as enhanced interrogation has violated constitutional treaties as well as the Eighth Amendment. In many cases, these constitutional violations continued for years before the public or even the federal courts had the knowledge to stop them. It was through the use of secret interpretations that the federal executive branch exposed its unobstructed ability to subvert the Constitution and the legal oversight of the judicial branch. The ACLU and other groups have been trying for five years now to go into court and challenge the constitutionality of the surveillance law by claiming that it violates the Fourth Amendment. We do have a constitution in the United States regarding searches and seizures. And the U.S. government has successfully blocked any challenge on the grounds that, well, we keep it a secret who it is that we eavesdrop on. And because we keep it a secret, no one person can say they've been eavesdropped on and therefore doesn't have standing in court to challenge the law. The debate between the protection of civil liberties and the advancement of national security dates back to the very creation of the United States. Since the attacks on 9-11, all branches of the federal government have proven unable to maintain a constitutional balance in this debate, prioritizing national security at all costs. My uh, whistleblowing actually uh, took started uh, in 2001, shortly after 9-11, which much to my horror, the United States essentially uh, conducted a coup against the Constitution and unchained itself from the rule of law and engaged in a whole series of activities, including um, the very foundational programs of, of mass surveillance. Well, I think that the laws that were passed, again, post 9-11, gave very broad authority. And it was endorsed by executives in two administrations, both Bush and uh, Obama. But the fact is, is that the Fourth Amendment is plain. It says you need a warrant that the Congress is trying to square Americans' constitutional right uh, under the Fourth Amendment uh, and the necessity for information that can be connected to terrorist activity here at home or abroad. It's a really difficult balancing act. 
in attempts to safeguard civil liberties. Civil rights activists are beginning to remember age-old solutions that also stem from early American history. The framers of the Constitution created two different systems of checks and balances in order to prevent tyranny and to protect the constitutional rights of the people. The first system is the horizontal division of power. This is known as the checks and balances between the three branches of the government, the legislative, executive, and judiciary. The other system is a vertical division of power, called federalism. In federalism, power is divided between the central federal government and the government of the states. The concept of federalism may play a crucial role in protecting the constitutional rights of Americans from the unrestricted interpreting power of the president and the federal executive branch. This raises a really interesting problem and one that I think we should pursue with our organs, and that is, what if one branch of government, one type of government, is trying to enforce its laws uh, when those laws are unconstitutional and when uh, the people in Lane County through their elected government or through initiative have passed their own law. Unfortunately today, the history and original intent of the federalist system is either misunderstood or deeply ignored by much of the American public and their governmental representatives. This dangerous misunderstanding is fueled by the modern interpretations of Article 6, Section 2 of the U.S. Constitution, known as the Supremacy Clause. Many modern interpreters of this clause believe it forces states to comply with every and any federal law that is passed and federally interpreted. Thanks to whistleblowers, the American public has witnessed an increased trend in federal laws that have been secretly interpreted to deny the constitutional rights of the people. As citizens become more concerned with the potential threats of an out-of-control president and executive branch, it is important for citizens to relearn the important civil protections offered by our federalist form of government. One of the earliest demonstrations of American federalism was written in the Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions by Thomas Jefferson and the father of the Constitution, James Madison, in 1798. Within 10 years of signing the Constitution, the federal government passed the Alien and Sedition Acts that severely violated the First Amendment rights of the American people. The Virginia and Kentucky Resolutions simply outlined the constitutional role of the states when confronted with such unconstitutional laws. The Kentucky Legislature passed Thomas Jefferson's resolution which stated, The several states composing the United States of America are not united on the principle of unlimited submission to their general government. Whensoever the general government assumes undelegated powers, its acts are unauthoritative, void, and of no force. Similarly, Virginia's resolution written by James Madison stated, In case of deliberate, palpable, and dangerous exercise of other powers not granted by the said compact. The states who are parties thereof have the right and are in duty bound to interpose for arresting the progress of evil and for maintaining within their respective limits the authorities, rights, and liberties appertaining to them. These resolutions outline two important constitutional principles. State governments have the power to disobey federal laws and orders that clearly conflict with the Constitution and states are duty-bound, meaning required to stop the progress of any unconstitutional actions carried out by the federal government in their jurisdictions. American federalism is designed to protect the Constitution and the rights of the people in two ways. It gives the rights of the federal government to assure local jurisdictions are not infringing upon the constitutional rights of their residents, like we've seen before in cases surrounding issues of discrimination, segregation, and equality under the rule of law. However, our federalist system also provides that same responsibility to the states to assure the federal government doesn't violate the rights of the people as we're beginning to see more and more in this new age of terror. In 2012, a dangerous new anti-terrorism law was enacted that has become one of the clearest examples for the need to reaffirm that system of federalism. Even in 2017, many civil rights groups agree the law remains one of the greatest threats to Americans' constitutional rights. In a scathing statement, the head of the ACLU said that Mr. Obama's decision to sign the National Defense Authorization Act, or NDAA, including the controversial detainee provisions, would tarnish his presidency. Quote, President Obama's action is a blight on his legacy because he will forever be known as the president who signed indefinite detention without charge or trial into law. Human Rights Watch chastised the president even before the act was signed. Codifying indefinite detention inside the U.S., mandating military detention for all terrorism suspects found inside the U.S. would really set the U.S. back, you know, decades in terms of how we approach terrorism. 
when communities across the United States attempted to protect their residents from the law's unconstitutional use, a number of shocking political and financial roadblocks were exposed. These roadblocks not only attempted to ignore the founding principles of American federalism, but seemingly prevented state officials and their residents from protecting even the most basic constitutional rights from federal abuse. You know, my, my interest in this, you know, is to protect the rights of our citizens. At the same time, we have to balance the protection of those rights with our duty um, to our, our oath to uphold the laws of the United States and also to uh, our fiscal <clears throat> responsibilities to the, the citizens. The last update we got from legal counsel, I believe, was in December of last year, was so devastating about the negative in impacts of a county ordinance. And at that time, we basically looked at each other in stunned silence and let it die. In part two of this video, you will find out why this new anti-terrorism law poses the greatest threat to Americans' constitutional rights and why the protections provided by the Federalist system may be the only way to stop it. In part three, you will see firsthand the political and financial roadblocks that are commonly used to strip states and communities the ability to protect their residents' constitutional rights from federal abuse. In this particular Federalist case study, the residents of the state of Oregon attempted to enact state and local laws that guaranteed their residents the right to a trial from being denied by the new anti-terrorism law. They were eventually told by top state officials that the new terrorism law did in fact deny citizens the right to a trial, but that it would be unconstitutional to pass local laws to restrict its use. This is the true story of the NDAA and the corrupted understanding of the federalist system within the system of power, with a conscience, who rises up to expose war crimes committed by our government will no longer speak. And finally, the NDAA. And you have to ask why. Why is there steady assault stripping away of our most cherished civil liberties? What's happening? They know that eventually there will be blowback. Eventually, people will respond. And they want the powers to, in essence, criminalize any form of dissent. And that's what this is about.